Hello, folks. We are back for round two. K.A. Nelson is a, still a naval historian, and he's still his book, Killing Shaw, is available in the links below. And we're talking about another action off the East Coast. I'll bring him in now. Hello again. It seems deja vu. We've only just been yeah. talking, but here Long we are. Long time again. no see. Long time no see. Well, um, again, thank you for having me on, Paul. I really appreciate it. And for those of you that are just tuning in, this is the second of two unrelated stories about the Battle of the Atlantic that I'm sharing today. And this one is a little bit different. So for those that watched the last one about USS Attic, this is this takes place just three days after the sinking of the Attic and not too far away on the map either. So with that, we will get into it. Super. So to recap a bit, the statistics that I showed last time, uh, they've changed a little bit in the three days since our last story. So there have now been 65 merchant ships destroyed and two Navy warships sunk. The I don't know if I mentioned the death toll last time, but at this point on the 29th, it stands at 1,816. So this is, this is a dire emergency, both for the United States and for the Allies as a whole. But uh, despite this, there are still passenger ships sailing with passengers aboard. One of those was the City of New York, which was a diesel passenger freighter. It was actually built in Chester, Pennsylvania, which is only, I looked it up in between the, in the break. It's 36 minutes driving from where I am right now. This was, that was one of the uh, biggest shipyards in the United States during the war and, and prior to it. And the City of New York was on her way back from uh, South Africa to New York via Trinidad. And aboard were 82 merchant mariners, 41 civilian passengers, and nine U.S. Navy armed guards. Those civilian passengers included a 28-year-old woman, 28 woman named Desanka Mohorovicic, she was traveling with her two-year-old daughter, Vesna. Desanka's husband, and this was back when Yugoslavia was a country, Desanka's husband worked at the Yugoslav consulate in New York City. So she was on her way to link up, to reunite with him. She was also eight and a half months pregnant at this time. So the timing of this voyage for her was less than ideal. The merchant crew included a 42-year-old doctor, a surgeon named Len Conley. Dr. Conley had tried to join the armed forces as a doctor when after Pearl Harbor, but he was medically disqualified, so he joined the merchant marine as a doctor instead. So he was the ship's physician. Finally, within the nine Navy armed guards that are aboard, uh, that, that existed to operate the four-inch gun mounted on the aft deck, as well as the uh, eight belt-fed machine guns. One of those armed guards was a 19-year-old named Bill Carlson from Minneapolis, Minnesota. On the night of 29 March, the city of New York is making her way north. She has 330 miles left to go in her journey. The sea conditions were not good. There was uh, very high winds and the waves were as high as 15 feet. This is not unusual for this particular stretch of ocean because the, uh, the Labrador current and the Gulf Stream converge pretty much right about where that icon on the map is, which is uh, where the ship was sailing. She was uh, 56 miles uh, east northeast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. During this time, and unbeknownst probably to most of the passengers, the waters that they were sailing through, specifically North Carolina's waters, in March 1942, this was the most dangerous stretch of ocean on Earth. This was the focal point of U-boat activity and attacks in U.S. waters. And in fact, by the end of the war, roughly half of all of the U-boat attacks along the U.S. coast would occur along this stretch between uh, Cape Hatteras up here and Cape Lookout down here. This was referred to these waters by merchant mariners as Torpedo Junction, and with very good reason. Unsurprisingly, the city of New York is spotted by the U-160, which is a Type 9 U-boat under the command of George Lassen. The 
armed guardsman that was on lookout duty up in the crow's nest. He actually saw the torpedo coming in. He yelled torpedo port side, but it was too late to avoid it. The torpedo struck at the number three hold, which is right about amidships. And the fortunately for the passengers, the ship's crew had apparently been very, very well drilled because the instant this happened, the helmsman immediately turns the ship into the wind. The engineering department cuts the engines. The crew that are designated to help with evacuation immediately get to their lifeboat stations and the armed guards get to work. So the armed guards could see the, actually the periscope because the, um, because the seas were so rough, Lassen had actually submerged to, to, to make a shot. So they saw the periscope above the water. They fired about a dozen shots at it. This is also corroborated by Lassen's logbook. But the evacuation starts immediately. The ship's, uh, she's going down and the armed guards managed to buy enough time for the crew and passengers to abandon ship in the lifeboats. Carlson was firing the machine gun at the, one of the machine guns at the periscope. And it's the, the armed guards are the last ones off the ship. They end up jumping off and swimming to the lifeboats. Uh, Bill Carlson actually just stepped off the ship because the water had gotten you know, up to the bulwark. So he just kind of stepped off like he was in a swimming pool. But the four lifeboats, all four lifeboats do get launched. However, launching them is perilous because not only are the seas raging and the wind whipping, but the ship is obviously listing pretty hard to port, which is uh, sometimes makes the ships, the, the boats on that side of the ship impossible to be lowered. But fortunately, that was not the case. Among the people that are getting into these boats, in, they, there was uh, Desanka Mohorovicic and her two-year-old daughter. They get into the number four boat. Dr. Len Conley, keeping his eye on the, the pregnant woman, obviously, gets in with them. But Dr. Conley actually slips getting into the lifeboat and breaks two of his ribs. But he is in there along with a total of um, 19 other people, uh, among them being Desanka and her two-year-old daughter. While this is happening and the armed guards are still shooting back at the U-160, uh, George Lassen, the U-160 commandant, he goes around to the other side of the ship and he gives it what the Germans call the Fangschuss, the killing shot. So he puts another torpedo into the hull from the starboard side. The city of New York sinks by the stern. She goes down about 20 minutes after the first torpedo hits, there are 18 people killed by this point. So that leaves four lifeboats afloat in 15 foot seas with winds pushing 30 miles an hour and the weather hovering in the low 50. Some reports say it was 50 degrees. So this is not a good time to even be on a large ship, let alone to be in a 30 foot lifeboat. And as fate would have it, this is also the time when Desanka goes into labor. Fortunately, this is exactly why Dr. Conley had gotten into this lifeboat. Unfortunately, he has two broken ribs and only a first aid kit to work with. But what he does is he puts the, the boat sail. All these, most of these boats came with sails so they could be set up um, and, and moved by the wind. So he puts the sail over himself and Desanka and just kind of does the best that he can. The one historian that has done a lot of research about this, Kevin Duffus, I haven't met him, but he said, quote, the delivery would have been no easier if conducted on a roller coaster on a dark, rainy night. So just to give you um, a sense of the, the peril involved, and obviously the boat is partly flooded as well. It's crowded. It's not ideal situations for a human being to be coming into the world. So... Patrolling off North Carolina at the same time was the USS Roper. USS Roper was a former squadron mate of, of um, USS Jacob Jones, which had been sunk off Cape May about two, almost exactly two months earlier with the loss of almost all of her crew. So the Roper's crew is, they're eager for, for payback, but they're, they're very much on the alert while they're on patrol. It's the next morning at 0428, Actually, the, the Roper crew sees a flare in distance. They steer toward it 
And then as they get closer, they see a light flashing in an SOS signal. So three long flashes, three short flashes, three long over and over. That was the armed guard. That was uh, uh, Bill Carlson flashing the light. So the destroyer gets closer. It finds three lifeboats, not four. And the um, the getting on to the getting on to the, the destroyer from the lifeboats is is also perilous because again these waves are still going. They're heaving the the lifeboats up and down. So it's it's nerve wracking to get everyone finally on board the destroyer. But um, when the lifeboats first are, come up to the side and the cargo nets are un, unrolled. One of the sailors aboard the Roper was shocked to be handed a healthy newborn baby boy. That was the first thing that the survivors passed up. And uh, he was the boy, Tasaka's son, was born um, perfectly healthy, none the worse for wear. And he very quickly became a celebrity aboard the ship. All of the sailors wanted to go to the infirmary and see this, uh, this miracle baby that had been brought aboard. Dasanka came aboard as well. She was uh, in in good health, or as as good as as could be uh, considered at that time. And uh, Dasanka herself distinctly remembered the look on that uh, young sailor's face when she handed this um, the the child was you know baby was handed up to him. So this this story catches natural catches <clears throat> national attention as one might imagine. And among the, the nicknames that are bestowed upon this child are uh, the lifeboat baby, the son of Neptune, and the baby Hitler couldn't get. Mm. So because of the ship's name, Desanka chose to, the ship was named after a U.S. Naval officer named Jesse Roper. I believe he was a Spanish-American war figure, but Desanka named her newborn son Jesse Roper Mohorovicic. So this story makes national news. Lots of pictures like this are taken. I found that headline about injured docker Aid Stork to be particularly funny. There was a, another picture that I found in a New Jersey newspaper that um, I just thought this was perfect. And if you look at the bottom right, that's uh, Dr. Conley. And this is from the Daily Record of Monmouth County. I Probably not still published. Hmm. Now, Jesse himself ended up living a very successful uh, life, lived a full life. His, um, he died in 2005 after he was successful in the business world. He applied to the Merchant Marine Academy and was actually rejected because of his eyesight. But he did manage to secure <laughs> commission in the Navy. So he served uh, in the Navy and as part of his private sector work, he worked for a while on the business side of, for the same shipping line that owned the city of New York back in the day. And he died in 2005. And per his request, his ashes were buried at sea. But fortunately, this entire story has a quite a happy ending. Hmm. And that's what I have for you today, Paul. A little lighter note. Well, brilliant stuff. And um Less questions on the first show, but um, first one interesting is Soylent Green is saying, "What nationality does a baby get born in international waters?" Um, Good question. That's that's beyond my expertise, but the, I will say that the um, his birth certificate was basically um, printed by the ship. It was some official letterhead, and they wrote like Jesse Roper Mahorovich was born this day, and so his his he has a very unorthodox birth certificate. I should also mention that this is not a typo. Um, the family dropped the I, the second IC off their name. So right, okay. it was Mohorovicic, and then they dropped two, which kind of makes sense. But um, yeah, I'm not sure what citizenship, but he does. He did have a very interesting birth certificate. Okay, yeah, definitely. And, um, and a great story to tell at parties about yeah, where, where, are you, where are you from? Um, so a couple of qu technical questions about the SS New York. So Ian, uh, Ian was asking, what, fa how fast was it moving when it was first hit, and and was it zigzagging? I want to say twelve knots, which is what about fourteen miles an hour, which would have been about normal for a ship of that type and size. She was not zigzagging, but it zigzagging was um, useful, but zigzagging rarely saved anyone. I should add. Mm. And isn't that this, the subject came up in the sidebar about 
about troop ships and how often some of the light converted liners generally in World War II were pretty damn fast. So yeah. therefore they had that speed going going for them that, that some types of ships didn't have. Um, my question is, though, do you happen to know whether any of this story was part of the inspiration for Hitchcock to create the Lifeboat movie that came out a year later? Because Yeah, not that, sure. That, Wouldn't be surprised, though. You know, because I mean, I'm a bit, I'm a big movie buff. John Steinbeck wrote the screenplay for that movie. Did he really? Um, commissioned yeah. by Hitchcock, and Hitchcock had had the idea in 1942. Now, obviously, there's all sorts of naval disasters happening in 41 and yeah. 42, and there are lifeboat stories. I mean, Mount Batten was was lost a ship, so so it, I, I'm assuming it was like an amalgamation of various various really stories. Well, there's something yeah. about the human interest aspect of of life continuing and babies being born yeah. that, you know it's been a long time since i've seen that that hitchcock movie but it it is a cross section of society in the boat um yeah so i wonder whether there's an inspiration there that'd be really good i'd be um, surprised if there was no connection at all especially considering this was very widely reported on i wonder whether whether where hitchcock was living he was def definitely in the usa in world war ii wasn't he so i wonder whether he was east coast and would have read one of those newspapers that's that's one for the sidebar warriors to check yeah. he might have been hollywood someone fact checked there that yeah it's, it's, that was my first thought is he'd be in hollywood at the time because he was plenty busy um brilliant story so my my last question is going to be kind of referencing what i first asked at the beginning of the, of the first show is that when you're putting together a story your book about these incidents off the particularly new jersey coast mm -hmm. um did you have any rules for what counts and what doesn't count? You know, because there's New Jersey and there's New Jersey, you know, and, yeah. and how far out to sea does something become, you know, a middle of the Atlantic story? Did you have any rules or did you just kind of, if the story worked, you put it in? So both. So I did have a rule for what counted as a, as a New Jersey sinking. And of course there's no, I have to make sure my, yeah. um, of course there's no, there's no, you know, hard and fast guidelines. So, I generally went with uh, within 200 miles. I bent right. that rule in a couple of things. And I, I essentially put it to the test of if I can look at a map and see it, what I what I think right off the bat that that's a New Jersey sinking. So um, both of the stories that we covered today were obviously not New Jersey sinkings by any measure. Mm -hmm. But this book covers a lot more than just events that happened off New Jersey. New Jersey based stuff is, is what I call the main story. But yeah. there's a lot of a lot of spokes coming off that wheel of, as I mentioned earlier, stories that were just too good to leave out. So I, I have come to, when I explain the book in a nutshell, I say it's really about the German U-boat offensive in U.S. waters with a special focus on New Jersey. And that taking that approach gave me the leeway to be able to incorporate a lot of really great stories like this. Great. And then just kind of to conclude on that really is that now you're, you're obviously doing the circuit and you're going out and you're meeting military societies and book mm -hmm. groups, things like that. And, you know, this audience of World War II TV are, they're very knowledgeable, but generally how, how much do people know about these actions? I mean, if you meet an, Amer an American who considers himself a history buff, yeah, he'll know about Iwo Jima, he'll know about Normandy, he'll know about the U-boat campaign generally, but are they surprised generally just how much happened off that coast? Yes. Unfailingly. It's, it is rare, relatively uncommon for me to encounter anyone at any of these events that is um, that, that really has a, a, a firm understanding, which makes it makes it much better from my perspective, because I, I want to shock and surprise and educate. So the short answer is really it, it's rare for me to come across anyone that, that does understand this in depth. I will mention, though, that what I've gotten a lot of and what I sort of expected, but not to this extent, is the amount of myths that get repeated. Right. I've had many people at Q&A time at some of these events put their hand up and proudly announce some story that I now have to delicately kind of deflate. So I've been thinking about how to maybe address the myths, some of the most common myths preemptively. But um, I also enjoy that, too, because I enjoy setting the record straight. And there's a lot of um, hearsay and, and true mythology that surrounds us that doesn't have any factual basis. And I like being able to help people put that aside and then put the hard facts in front of them to replace it. Well, there is that whole thing where you get the kind of the, 
German U-boats in the Great Lakes and things. And then it kind of goes yeah. into spies coming ashore. Yeah. There's there's the end of it that's factual and about the Battle of Andy. Then it can get a little bit spurious and curious and and into the kind of the, the conspiracy theory stuff. And yeah. um, you know, it's like the whole you know we're going down a rabbit hole. But when Spielberg made the 1981 film with John Belushi, you know, there's that was oh, playing yeah. into that whole phobia and fear of the Japanese invasion on the West Coast that was very real in late 41, 42. You know that that. That, and yet, and so myths have gathered about just, you know, we get it in, in the East Coast of England. There are still these stories that won't go away of German paratroopers landing and fighting in villages and commando actions. And, you know, it's just one of the, it's what, what makes history interesting. And there's usually some kind of kernel of truth at the begin, at the bottom of it that then has been built on and, yeah. and taken to an extreme. But it's been fantastic talking to you and uh, we'll, we'll do it again, that. basically. And folks, you saw the book link, so that, uh, go out there, get the book, learn some of these stories. And folks, we're back in tomorrow and then Wednesday and maybe Thursday and then Friday. And then I'm off for a week doing my World War II TV uh, Normandy tour. So cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers. Bye. Thanks again, Paul. Bye.